John 3. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and, by, and that by believing you may have life in his name. In John 3. No one has ever <clears throat> has never gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to, to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So be it. Did you sneak in just now? <laughs> Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you. We do adore you because you would choose to love us. It just gives us a glimpse of what this love that we can experience for all eternity will be like. Lord, we see it in all of creation. We see it in your spirit that binds us together. We see it through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, to long for heaven, for our eternal home, and to live as aliens in this world, that we may bring you glory and honor, and that we may show other people the way, through the way that we love one another, and the way that we love you. Father, we do thank you and praise you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I don't have a sermon today, but that's okay, because I like talking about Jesus. But don't worry. <laughs> if you worry about anything, worry that this watch doesn't keep good time, because I can talk for hours. And if you have kept up with reading, then you realize that last week I did a boo-boo, and I read Second Peter chapter 1, 2, and 3, which got me behind this week. Whew! I got caught up Saturday morning. I finished John 8 and got it posted. Eight chapters of John. That's over a third of the Gospel of John in one week. That's a lot. We've covered a lot of ground, and I don't know where I'm going with it today. I guess there's so many places that we could go. And there's a lot, like Barry was saying, there's a lot of preparation time in that. And I'm so thankful that I've been able to do this, even during these hustle-bustle times, because it makes me realize, again, what's most important. The job that I have is not important. The house that I live in is not important. Even under these circumstances, the family that I have, it's not, not important, don't take my <laughs> words wrong, but I have no control over anything. And I thank God for each and every day that I have family in my life because it's a blessing. It's grace upon grace upon grace that He gives me those days. The health that He gives, everything that He gives is because of God's grace. We sinned against God. And we deserve His wrath. But instead, He loved us so much that He sent His one and only Son to die for us. That whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. And that hope that we have now should inspire us to live a life that brings Him glory and honor. And that shows and tells other people the way. So when you say that, and when my wife say that, says that, that they see Jesus in me, it means a lot. Because a lot of times, you might not see Jesus in me. You might not have seen him Wednesday night. Because <laughs> I was getting very frustrated. And the first thing I'm going to do is apologize if I said or did anything that was not becoming of Jesus Christ. I will humble myself before you and do my best to shepherd you as Jesus shepherds me. There's no excuses. The devil doesn't make you do anything. You do whatever you do yourself. And I'm blessed 
God blesses us so much. Even though this week has probably been one of the most hectic weeks I've had in my life, we had a good Awana's turnout. We've got some organization figured out there and everything. I got to see my grandchildren yesterday. My two youngest ones are walking. So now that you've got three itty bitty ones running around over the place and then Kira just, what's this, what's that? Show me this, show me that. Wow. And if you hadn't noticed, I got another son back in my life. If you know anything about my past, and it's kind of crazy. <laughs> it's just walking by faith somewhat. Don't start crying. Because <laughs> when this young man was a little boy, he just showed up in our lives. I mean, literally just showed up in our lives. And we took him into our home, and he was there for a long time. And the reason that he's here right now is because he saw Jesus in us. Plain and simple. So God is so, so good. If I had a title for today, if I did, it's probably going to be that you may believe, because that's what the gospel, gospel of John is. Or it would be what love ain't. So I'm going to start there first. There's a country music song. Ooh, yeah, I know what it is. And I'm taking some of the stanzas. I guess that's right, not the chorus, but the stanza. That's the opposite. Am I saying it right? Okay that say, and, and I, the second one I don't agree with, just so you know, because it's a country music song, so it's going to mention uh, alcohol. <laughs> Hotels are made for two-night stays, not a two-night stand, two-night stays, okay? Checking in and checking out. That's what they're there for. They're for a place to stay. Meeting strangers in the lobby, waking up and leaving town the next day, but love ain't. Get the point here. Love isn't for a short period of time. And whiskey's poured for when you're bored and alone on Friday night, when you want to lose yourself and need a place to hide from all the pain, but love ain't. See, that's a lie from Satan again. These things will take care of the hurt in your life and everything. There's only one thing that will take care of the hurt and pain from the consequences of sin, Jesus Christ. That's why he had to become flesh and blood and live and die for us. This was God's plan all along because he loves us. Third stanza is sad movies are for crying on the couch there in the dark. That sad song, it was written just to try and get your heart to break. But love ain't. Your heart may be breaking, I don't know the circumstances in your life, anything else. I don't know the pain and suffering that you're going through. But God loves you. And whenever you listen to a lie from the devil, from the word, he's going to say you're not good enough. God doesn't love you. He doesn't exist. He's left you. God is dead. Whatever the, the, the thing is that the world will tell you. But that's not what love is. Love is the fact that God adores you adores you enough that he would send his son and die for your sins. And if you read the Gospel of John, you'll see that through and through and through and through. There's so much there. And again, I don't know where I'm going to concentrate yet, but I know one story that I'm going to talk about. But I'm going to turn to John chapter 1 and kind of give you a review first of what we should have read this week <laughs> or last week and this week if you followed your calendar where you didn't have to do eight chapters, you just had to do five. But John starts out his gospel in verse 4. Well, he starts it out within the beginning because he correlates Genesis, the beginning of history of man, with Jesus Christ being there. Jesus Christ is God. He was in the beginning. He was the Word. He was made flesh and dwelt among us. But verse 4 says, In Him there was life. Don't forget this, the verse that Merle read at the end of the chapter is John wrote this and all of these signs that John recorded is so that you might believe and so that because you believe you will have life. Now if that's not love that Jesus would come and die for you, that this was God's plan for you, even more does he show his love for you that you can have life. Not just eternal life, but life to live in this world, the holy life that he requires you to live. Could you imagine what heaven would be like if God graded on the curve? 
I mean, we have to be a holy, set-apart people. And all through history, we see Israel's failure and we see a faithful God. And now, because Jesus Christ comes to this world and He dies for us, then if we believe in Him, we're born again by the Spirit. We're born again into new life. So the old is gone. Remember that. The old is gone. Get rid of it. So whenever you do fall down, get back up. Oh, don't try to do it on your own, though. I was talking to Nathan a little bit last night. You try to do it on your own, and you'll see that in the Gospel of John. You'll continue to fail over and over and over again. Because, see, each time Jesus is reaching down His hand to help lift you up out of the mud, out of whatever the problem is that you're in in your life. In Jesus there is life. So do you believe? Verse 11 he came to the world that was his own, but his own people did not accept him. But to all who did accept him and believe in him, he gave the right to become children of God. God's own child. Not just saved, not just going to heaven, but you are God's child. That means you inherit everything that your father has in his kingdom, at his possession. And you have it here and now in this world. Don't let Satan tell you any differently. So if you're fighting a sexual addiction, if you're fighting drugs or alcohol, if you're fighting um, depression in your life, anything else, God has equipped you with the powers that He has and the riches that He has from the kingdom of heaven given to you now. You have victory in Jesus Christ. Get up out of the mud and live a life that brings Him glory and honor. Experience what true love is, not what love ain't. Love is not for a two-night stand or two-night stay or anything else. God loves you for all time. He loved you before you ever were created. He loved you and knitted you together in your mother's womb. He loves you wherever you're at, whether you're walking on the mountaintop or you're down in the valley low stuck in a mud pit. He loves you. And He wants all men to come to saving faith. So as you read on in John chapter 1, you get down to verse 19, and the Levites and priests come and says, Who are you? To John the Baptist. And John says, I am only a messenger. I'm only the one proclaiming who this Messiah is, and he is now amongst you. It's not me you need to be asking the question who I am. It's you need to be asking who Jesus is. And I, when I ask that question, I'm asking it to you. Who is Jesus to you? The thing about John 3.16 and believing to the world is this. Yes, I believe Jesus came and died for my sins. I'm saved. No, you're not. That's a lie from the devil. And we need to tell the world that and we need to live and show that. If you believe that Jesus Christ is who He said He is, then you will love God the Father with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. You will try your best to live a holy life, and then you'll realize you can't again. And when you finally give that problem to Him, He'll take it away. Nathan and I were talking again last night, and I said, when, when God called me to be a pastor, I said, I can't be a pastor. i got a mouth like a sailor. <laughs> and he said... You've tried to conquer that. Give it to me and I'll take it. And I have to really think about it. Now I have to really let Sherry get me mad to say something that I shouldn't say. And then I know I've said it. I'm like, I'm just going to spark her interest if I do. And I rarely do that. <laughs> just so you know. Did you notice anything while reading John 2 about numbers? Did you see three written quite often? Did you see six written quite often? Did you see seven written more than anything? You see seven written more and more times in the book of John than any number. It is amazing if you get looking for it. Look for it. Did you know there's seven women mentioned in John? Did you know there's only seven of the disciples mentioned in John? Do you know there's seven signs? That's all the miracles that are, that are performed in John, seven of them. Did you notice in chapter 1 there's seven names given for Jesus? There's seven declarations from people about who Jesus is. Wow. And John wrote this work, and it doesn't borrow from any of the other three Gospels. And it was written quite later. I don't know how much later. There's debate about that, where it was written 
around AD 70 to as late as AD 90. But Jesus died somewhere around AD 30, 35. Don't hold me exact on my numbers. I could be wrong on those. I told the kids the other day wrong about the length of the ark. So don't, it's not blasphemy up here. It's just what I'm thinking. But I will go back and look and, and make any corrections if I need to. But seven is recorded all throughout. Now, the reason I mention that, and I'll mention it again in a little bit, is number six is the number of man. Okay? That's all that means, nothing else. And Revelation talks about six, six, six. Even when Jesus told Peter, how many times shall I forgive? Seven times 70. You and I, man, have sinned against God. And we continue to try to make things right. Or we don't at all because we don't even care. We don't even recognize God. We don't care about His gracious love through Jesus Christ. We, there are people that even say Jesus Christ didn't, didn't exist. There's more historical evidence for Jesus Christ existing than there is for Shakespeare existing or Julius Caesar existing. More written document, documentation in history. And you can't deny these signs that Jesus did. And as you read this gospel, you're thinking, how in the world could they continue to see the signs done by the finger of God himself and then deny what Jesus said? How did he do these things? So then you have to sit and listen to what Jesus said, and you said, well, he is crazy Looney Tune, or he is God. And the signs back it up. If he was Looney Tunes and couldn't perform the signs, that'd be one thing. But he performed the signs. And even if you look at the signs that are performed, and John especially, there's a progression that leads you to the last sign, the seventh sign, is Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. The same name that happens to be recorded in another gospel account, which says, let Lazarus come back and tell me about this future that I'm missing out on. The first miracle, what was it? Water into wine. And that seems like such an insignificant little thing. But as you're reading it, and as you study God's Word to be an approved workman, you'll understand there are seven festivals. Okay? When Jesus speaks up in chapter 7, I think, we'll get there in a minute, He's at the Festival of Tabernacles, the seventh of the seven festivals. It lasts seven days. See all the significance? And in a marriage ceremony, they generally lasted for seven days. They could go a little shorter and everything, but generally seven days. It wasn't like we did. It's a festival. And there's a lot of drinking of wine going on because there's partying. Wine, fermented wine. Not non-fermented wine, but we won't go down that path. And when the wine ran out, it meant the celebration was over. And not only was the celebration over, but the groom was, uh, not, what's the word I'm looking for? Humiliated. And even more than that, who paid for it? The father. He was humiliated. So Jesus' first miracle says there is no point for you to be humiliated. Even if you're in the worst circumstance, which this doesn't seem like a worst circumstance for wine to run out, but it was a tragedy to them for this celebration. And Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was coming into the world, is in the world. You should be celebrating. But on the other hand, it's just a simple miracle, not simple, simple in the changing chemical compositions. He's the God of all that. But a simple thing, if the wine ran out, okay, we do something else. Right? But we don't do something else. We don't settle for this life. We don't chase after the things of this world that we think we can find happiness in. Happiness, celebration, comes through Jesus Christ. And when He turned the water into wine, He did it in such a way that there was an abundance and it was the best wine. So all these things you're chasing after, even if it's family, to make you happy, that is nothing compared to realizing what God's love is for you. If you didn't catch it, there were six ceremonial jars. Six, the number of man. 
trying to reach God, trying to find happiness and peace, but never being able to because no one is righteous, no, not one. So Jesus Christ had to come to save us, but he did come because he loves us. Do you love him? Do you believe? In John chapter 1, there are six, excuse me, seven titles given to Jesus. Maybe you saw them, maybe you didn't. The Lamb of God, Rabbi, which is teacher, depending on how yours is, Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Let's see if I've got them all. I'm trying to spot them. Lord, Son of God, King of Israel, Son of Man. Now, Jesus referred to himself as Son of Man quite often, and you'll see this in, in the Scriptures, because that's a prophetic term that was given to him from Daniel. So he refers to himself as the fulfilled prophecy. And these declarations are from different people, John the Baptist, from Nathaniel, from Peter. And like I said, as you go through, you'll see that there are seven of them. As we go past John chapter 2, because I'm going to come back to that, you get John chapter 3, of course, where Nicodemus comes to Jesus, but if you notice, he comes to him at night because he doesn't want the light to expose him. There's so much theology here written in such simple terms if you'll simply look at it and believe. And Jesus tells Nicodemus that the only way his religion, he's the leader of the religious leaders. The only way that he can get to heaven is to be born again. He will not see and he definitely will not enter the kingdom of heaven unless he's born again. And that comes from being born again by the Spirit. When we get to chapter 4, there's this Samaritan woman. And this Samaritan woman is the half-breed scum. And she's a woman, on top of that, that lives between... Judea, Jerusalem, and, some, and uh, Galilee. No one went through that land. But if you notice in chapter 4, it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. He didn't have to. He could have went around like the rest of the world. Because the rest of the world wants to avoid those that are less than. Or those that have another religious uh, uh, theology. And you know, we tend to do that. Because we'll go out to those that are lost, maybe, as long as they're not too lost. But we won't go usually out to those that proclaim a slightly different gospel message. And I don't know why that is, except that it's Satan, of course. And if you realize from this story, the disciples have no idea what's going on. They miss the whole point whatsoever. And this woman that Jesus says, if you knew who I was, I would give you living water. She believes. Childlike faith. She says, give me this living water. Even though she thinks Jesus is talking physical, you're going to see this pattern all throughout. We think physically because we see all this and we can't comprehend spiritual God and it's hard to follow Him, but yet we see all this out here, but it's not hard to follow Him if you're born again because the wind blows. It's the power behind what we do see out there. You don't see the wind blow those trees sideways but you see the effect from it. And if you're born again, then people should be seeing your life that way, especially who you were. This woman was an adulterous, scandalous woman that went to the well at noon so the rest of the world would not see her. And the well was outside the town, so she, you have to hike there and carry your water back in the heat of the day. This would have been a cumbersome job. Most people would have came early. But she didn't come then because she was ashamed of her sin. Whew, that's the first thing. If you're ashamed of your sin, then you're okay. Because that means you realize you need to be saved. You take and try to help somebody that's sitting here in the water, if this was water, and you try to throw them a life preserver, and they say, no, I'm fine, I'm treading on my own. They're not going to grab the life preserver. But when they realize they're drowning, they're going to yell out, and when they see that life preserver come to it, they're not only going to take a hold of it, they're going to cling to it. Because it'll save their life. And this woman clings to what Jesus has told her, even though she doesn't understand. And she goes back to the town, and the town comes, and a lot of the town gets saved. Now think about that. 
Number one, this is a woman not worth wasting your time over. This is a woman that Jesus had to go out of the norm and go through this place instead of going around this place. As a God-man, he had to realize that she was going to be there at noon, approximately noon, not exactly. And if you look at a map, if you look where that's at, where uh, Jacob's well is, it's about a little over halfway through Samaria. Samaria was a two days journey to go through. If she was going to be there at noon, that means that he, Jesus had to get up. If you take, I went to Google Map and I showed the kids Wednesday night Israel. But if you go that and put a dot on it with Google Map, you can draw a ruler. And you don't know exactly where Jesus was baptizing at, but you draw a ruler down and as the fro crow flies, it's at least 25 miles, give or take. Then you throw in topography and winding roads and everything else. We're talking, let's say, 32 miles. I read a thing saying it was 42, how this guy calculated it. and All of his calculations look good, but we don't know what it was. But it's over 25 because it's 25 miles, give or take, as the crow flies. If you walk fast, you ever walked on a treadmill? I know most of you got clothes hanging on a treadmill if you've got one. But if you ever walk on it, four mile an hour is a hefty walk especially if you incline that baby up and down and everything else and you put rocks on it to stumble over and everything else. If he was going to be there at noon, we're going to use that as an absolute number, although it says about noon, then he had to leave at 4 a.m. to go 32 miles. If he wanted to stop and take a water break or have his disciples catch up, he needed to leave at 3 a.m. Would you get up at 3 a.m. because you knew somebody was going to be at this place at noon? and you had to tell them to, about Jesus so they could be saved? And would you walk that distance on top of that? His disciples had no idea. And you see Jesus going from a water turning, uh, miracle of turning water to wine, talking about the celebrations come, to a religious leader saying, I believe you, but I don't believe you to a woman who has no idea and who is being influenced by another gospel. And Jesus says, I love you the least of these. And he comes there to save her. And there's a little revival that goes on. And his disciples don't, don't really even have a part in it. And he says, which I think you did in scripture already, that a time is coming when we true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. Because there's no way that you can worship God without being born again. You might know and re recognize there is a God. You might believe that Jesus Christ existed and that He died and that He rose again on the third day. But that's not true belief. You will still die in your sins. If Jesus says that many on that day will cry out, Lord, Lord, and did mighty miracles in His name, that's more than just believing that Jesus was a man and died, and yeah, we don't know where His body went, but yeah. Believing means that He has changed you from the inside out. You are a new creation. You're born again. And you're powered and blown about by the wind, the Spirit of God, to live a new life. After chapter 4, you had chapter 5, of course, right? And Jesus goes on to Galilee and heals a nobility man's son from death. Not, he's not dead yet, but the, no, the noble man said, he will die if you don't come. And Jesus said, I'm going to heal your son. These are paraphrasing, of course. Even though you don't believe. And then the man went to see what happened and found out that right when Jesus said that, his son was healed. So you have the second of seven signs. And again, John says these are signs. He doesn't say these are miracles because a sign is more like a parable. It's like taking the teaching and then applying the parable and putting it all together. And if you read carefully, you can see all these significances in it of what this sign means. Jesus turned water into wine. We can celebrate now because... We won't die in our sins. Jesus brings living water to the, the least of these scandalous women and she won't die in her sins anymore. He shows that he has power over death because this child is going to die, but he doesn't. Then you got the man in chapter 5. He's been laying as an invalid for 38 years. 
No one loves this man. 38 years. We, we got another story in the gospel where some friends take some guy, uh, a guy to Jesus and lo re literally take the roof off the house and lower him down to Jesus. If you didn't notice from John's gospel, significant times have passed. We're two years roughly into Jesus' ministry here. People know who Jesus is. People know what this, we this pool is. It's a pool where supposedly, and you're version may have the verse in there, it may not have it, where an angel comes down and stirs the water every once in a while. So if I'm sick and I can get to that pool, I'm going to be healed. Whether that's legend or truth, doesn't matter. That's why this guy was here. And he'd been there for 38 years. And he had no one in this world to help him get to the pool. He had no one in this world to tell him about Jesus because he didn't know who the man was that told him to get up and take his mat and walk. What kind of world do we live in where we won't help those who can't help themselves? And not only will we not help them, but we won't tell them about somebody that can. 38 years. And what John is saying from this gospel here is Jesus cares. If no one else cares, Jesus cares. The pit that you're in, the disease that you have, the hardship that you have in your life, Jesus cares. But He's going to ask you first, are, do you want to be healed? Because you can't be saved again unless you'll take the life preserver that He's throwing. It's of no good, no consequence. You've got to want to be healed. And then you've got to respond. The man could have laid there and said, no, nah, I don't believe it. He could have felt strength in his legs, everything else. He said, no, nah, it's too much effort. I've been here too long. What about the sores I'm going to have and stuff? It's going to be hard to move after this. It's stiff muscles, you know, after days. He got up and walked. He had no idea who healed him. And then he went to the temple, if you didn't notice, for answers and didn't find them there in religion, did he? But Jesus found him again in the temple. And then he told him, he said, don't go and sin anymore or something worse will happen to you. Now, he wasn't saying that his sins, you've got to read this story all along so you can get, grasp this. He's not saying your sins cause this pain, although your sins cause all the suffering in this world. This is not what God wanted for you. He wants you to be in his presence. He wants you to walk with him as Adam and Eve walked in the garden. And he gave them one command, and they couldn't keep it. He wants you to not suffer. Jesus was not saying you're suffering because. Jesus is saying you know the truth now. So you better go and live it or something worse will happen to you. You will die in your sins. You think 38 years as a paraplegic was bad when no one cared about you? One of the things I always heard from the youth group kids is, well, I don't know. If I go to hell, at least my friends will be there and we'll be partying. Hell will be the absence of everything. God's light still shines on this earth. And it should be shining through us now. That's why the verdict is out in John 3, 19 that light has come into the world and we will either walk as a child of light or we won't walk as a child of light because we're afraid that our sins will be exposed. That's why the first thing I have to tell you today is if I sin Wednesday, please forgive me. <laughs> I got really mad. I don't know about mad, upset, frustrated. I don't know that I got mad. That wouldn't necessarily be the right thing. Because I thought I knew the right answers. A lot of other people thought they knew the right answers. And we all come together and said, we don't all know the right answers, but when we come together, we can do better. And we love each other and we can move on. You've got to decide if you want to be well. And then Jesus can heal you. He can heal you of everything. Then you've got to decide to go and sin no more. So let's apply that to this world. Let's apply it to if I have a, a, an addiction to pornography. Once I realize the truth that God loves me so much that He gave His Son to die for me and that I'm born again and that I can live a righteous, holy life, then you know what? Then the pornography has to go. And it can't go because I can do anything about it because I've tried for years. I might be talking a little personal too even maybe. I can't do it. I've struggled to do it. But He can take it all away from you like that. He did take it away from you like that. 
You just got to realize it so that you don't go and sin anymore. And so instead, you're a light to the world, drawing others to Jesus Christ. So they see what you were and what you are now. And just like the woman at the well, why in the world would they believe her when she went back to town? This is the tramp of the town. And they believed her because it's a God thing. And they went out to see for themselves who Jesus really is. Wow. Then we get John chapter 6. And we get the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on water. Four signs so far. Don't mention Peter walking on water here either. Just mentions Jesus does. There's not much about that, mirror, that sign in John. So maybe he wrote that one in there so you go study the other Gospels. But don't really know. But in the feeding of the 5,000, he brings about a miracle based on you know who Jesus is now. You're not supposed to sin anymore. What are you going to do with it? So he asked Philip, how can we feed this crowd? And I did some calculations and I think I said it on the video. But Philip says basically we'd have to work and I think it was a half a year. I don't remember what it is. Let me see if I can find it right here. Half a year to give them one bite of food. Now, if you calculate that out to the average person takes 100 bites a day, three meals, that's 33 and one-third bites per meal, and it takes a half a year's pay to get one bite. You see where I'm going? I think my calculations came out to be 16 and a half years to pay for this meal. That's a big tab. Throw liquor onto it, wine if they had any. Woo, you'd have a big bill. That's impossible for man. Impossible. But Jesus takes what little is provided. Oh, wow. Because I don't have much to offer Jesus. Maybe you're the Samaritan woman at the well. Maybe you think you've got more. You know, all that we have is by the grace of God, whatever you have. But he'll take what little you have. He took a little insignificant child with five and two, seven again, and he fed the multitudes. And there was an abundance, 12 baskets left over. Let's go back to the water and the wine. There were six ceremonial jars, men trying to wash their sins away themselves. And, and if you know anything about that, that was cumbersome and tedious. And you didn't go in first, you bathe, bathe first. What would they even do now that the water had turned to wine? What are they going to wash their, themselves with? They're coming in dirty. There's so many variables. But man trying to cleanse himself... And the joy runs out and Jesus says, I'm cleansing you. So I didn't say that before. And the joy is here because I'm here. You don't need that ceremonial washing anymore. And then there's abundance because he turns those six pots into water. That's about 150, 180 gallons of, of wine. That was probably more than they could drink. Oh, you didn't notice. Let's see. There was, if you counted the names of the disciples that were there plus Jesus, there's seven of them. Hmm. Anyway, there are what little meager existence you have, a little boy's lunch, and he feeds this incredible crowd of 13,000 people, give or take, and there's an abundance left over. But the sad thing is, is that most of the world are only going to what, want what God can offer them. They want a Savior, if they even realize that, but they don't want a Lord. Do you believe? Because if you believe in your heart and profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you're saved. John 6, verse, 6, verse 66, 666. Wow, amazing how that comes out too because that was in the King James edition 1,500 years after most of Jesus' own disciples deserted him because they relied more on man's ability to save themselves. They thought physically, they thought with their eyes, rather than spiritually. And they denied Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And they continued to try to work their way to heaven. But Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He's living water and He's the bread of life. Will you consume Jesus. Then in John chapter 7, it starts out with even Jesus' brothers don't believe him. 
They want him to go to Jerusalem. If you haven't noticed the pattern here, most of his miracles are in Galilee. When he goes to Jerusalem, it's a key around one of the seven festivals. They wanted him to go to Jerusalem so that he could increase his fame and popularity. If he really was going to become king, by man's ability, you've got to attain this kingdom. Jesus already is the king. <laughs> There's nothing to attaining. And when he does return, everyone will know that he's king. Angel armies will be by his side. But as Merle read in John 3, 16, in those verses, this time he didn't come in the world to condemn, but to save. And whoever believes will be saved. They will have life. Jesus' brothers don't even believe him, but yet he goes to the uh, fe festival of the tabernacles. And he gets up and says, in verse 37, On the last and most important day of the feast, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. If anyone believes in me, rivers of living water will flow out from that person's heart, as Scripture says. We're back to the living water. You're either consuming Jesus or you're not consuming Jesus. If you don't eat physically, what happens to you? You die. At some point, you die. If you don't eat spiritually, and Jesus is saying Him, then you will die spiritually. If you die in your sins and trespasses then you will face God's wrath for all eternity. But that's not what God wants. That's why He sent His one and only Son. Do you believe? In verse 8, chapter 8, I'm sorry, you go back to this adulterous woman. Now, if you read and studied it all, you'll notice that the last verse in chapter 7 and the first 11 verses in chapter 8 look like they don't fit. Because Jesus is at the Feast of the Tabernacles and then He goes to this woman that they want to kill because she's worthless. Another adulterous woman. And Jesus says, let them who are without sin cast the first stone. And the older guys go by away first because they got a little more wisdom in life. Okay? Or should anyway. And then the younger guys go away and then there's no one left to condemn this adulterous woman again that the world says is worthless. And Jesus says, is there anyone here to condemn you? And she says, no. He says, then neither do I. There is no condemnation. There is an offer of salvation now. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow might be the day of the Lord, and the day of salvation is done. And then Jesus will be gathering His own sheep and if you get the metaphor there, there will be sheep and goats in the same pasture. He will separate the ones, the goats that think they're sheep or think they're safe in pasture. And they will go to eternal damnation. And the true sheep will go to eternal life. In verse 12, Jesus says, Jesus talk, later Jesus talked to the people again saying, I am the light of the world. The person who follows me will never live in darkness, but will have the light that gives life. Now that's where we've got to so far to kind of give you a quick summary. We started with light. We're ending with light because we're already way through God's, the John's gospel that if you believe, if you see all these signs, then you're going to start to walk in the light. And even Nicodemus has come back to Jesus a second time and said, hey, hey, let's listen to him. But he was afraid of what others would do. He's so close, but yet so far. Close only counts, I've always been told, in horseshoes and hand grenades, right? It doesn't count for eternity. You either are a child of heaven or you're not. Now I want to go back to the chapter 2 for just a minute. And then I want to play it. Actually, you got the video ready? <laughs> 